hi, I'm Kay Guntupali, and I'm a practicing physician. Today, I would like to give you a clinician story with a human and a professional dimension. To know my story, to put it into the context of today, you need to take the journey with me, an immigrant's journey. Towards that end, I would like to transport all of us back to the turn of the century India in 1900s to meet my grandmother. My grandmother was widowed at the age of 28 with four children to raise and with no money, no education, but plenty of unhelpful relatives. <laughs> Knowing the importance of education, she decided to sell her jewelry, as was a practice in the ambitious poor in those days and even now, and educated her three sons. While, as was practiced in those days, she married off her daughter, who was my mother, to my father. Now, my grandmother was a very, very courageous woman. I was told that when I was very young, I was walking on the edge of a deep well, admiring my reflection in the water, shimmering water below, when she happened to pass by. Against all instincts of even well-educated people, she did not scream, she did not panic, she did not even call out my name very gently to coax me to go to her, but she just tiptoed behind me, grabbed me by my waist, and pulled me to safety. Now, to come back to my parents' story, let's get back into our DeLorean and go back a little bit fast forward to 1930s. My parents were married as teenagers, and they moved to another state called Hyderabad. In this particular state, in those uh, days, uh, it was ruled by King Nizam. And uh, it was a very conservative state, and the women could not walk on the streets without a full veil or a male relative accompanying them. And here, my father decides that my mother needs to get an education in these circumstances. In fact, he was thought that he was crazy and inconsiderate for having asked my mother to go get education, that none of his relatives gave him money to buy books for my mother. So he decided to teach her alphabets in three languages and encourage her to study. So she went on to finish high school and then went on to finish a degree in mathematics and literature and became a teacher. In fact, she was so motivated that she registered for master's degree in literature when I, as the youngest of the five kids, was in medical school. And now, as you know, my parents voted with their feet when it came to education of women. And uh, as though to test my father's will at, um, and his resolve for women's education, he was blessed with one son but four daughters. As you can see, I'm the youngest that's sitting, standing in front of my mother. So for us, it was not if we would go to college, but what it is that we did when we got to the college. So all four of our sisters ended up choosing medical profession and became physicians in one generation. In fact, a lot of times, you know, I wondered who was it that was actually paying for my education? When, you see, it only cost me like maybe just $40 for the entire five years of education. In 1974, I came to United States with a diploma in one hand and $8 in the other. And this diploma weighed very heavily in my hand because I knew the strength and power of what I was holding. While this gave me the chance to train in the best possible system in the world, it also gave me a tremendous sense of responsibility. As I was mentioning, it only cost me $8 a year for the entire five years of medical education. I often wondered who was it that was actually paying, footed my bill. Was it an agricultural laborer or a farmer? Paradoxically, who might never see the doctor he helped train or even avail of the services when he needs one. So you, it, it is also said that to whom much is given, 
much is also expected. So if you agree with me on, those, on that statement, how does one actually give back to the society? And I'll t give you two examples of how I have done that. One of it is I, start, I started with the help of many friends, a tertiary care hospital in my hometown and a medical school. And actually, in one of the times when we were starting the hospital, uh, we advertised for a paramedical professionals called respiratory therapists. And nobody applied. And only then I realized that uh, this particular field does not even exist uh, in those days in India. So I helped start a, a school of respiratory therapy, and this is one of the first graduates that's getting his diploma. His name is uh, Mr. Reddy. So fast forward maybe uh, four years uh, later. And in 1999, I was making rounds in the ICU when there was an agitated young man who was looking for help from me to take care of his very sick brother in Delhi. That afternoon, I found myself on a flight to meet this stranger. And after walking through a sea of relatives and friends, I found this young man to be extremely sick with a bad pneumonia, failing lungs, on a ventilator. My many years of experience gave him less than a 30% chance of survival. Now, the family, I would see the picture of a, a new saint or a god every day on the windowsill. I would see a lot of money being kept in his limp hand that would later be used to feed the poor. I saw many such gestures by this very helpless family. Faith, by definition, actually asks you to put trust in a higher power to make things happen somehow. In fact, the brother told me that this particular patient, according to his horoscope, he was supposed to go home four weeks hence. My challenge, on the other hand, was of a different kind. This hospital at that time did not have any respiratory therapist to help me take care of this patient. So I make a call to the institute that we started, and I asked, can you please send me some help? So by evening, I get two therapists. One of them is Mr. Reddy, and they both take, took 12-hour shifts and uh, you know, for the next few weeks. And uh, it was just gratifying to see that. In fact, exactly four weeks later, on December 30th, my patient walked out and went home in time to, in time to celebrate Welcome New Year by dancing uh, with his wife. That day, I felt that the rationality of science and the power of faith somehow complemented each other. Fast forward another five years later, I was making rounds in a hospital in Bahrain, and I saw my name called in a very thick Indian accent. I said, boy, who's calling me here? And I turned around. It was the same Mr. Reddy who was the first graduate who helped take care of this patient and now was helping patients in Bahrain. Now, I believe in synchronicity, and some people will call coincidence, but I would like to call this good karma. Another way perhaps you could help is by getting involved in large organizations to leverage the strength of numbers. I have been quite fortunate to lead two organizations, American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin in 98, and more recently, American College of Chest Physicians, my lead professional organizations. These are not just self-aggrandizing positions with strong photo opportunities. You can actually make a difference. I'll give you an example. At one of the board meetings of ACCP, they were discussing about disseminating materials about bad effects of tobacco, that they had developed beautiful materials for USA. And they said, let's just translate into different world languages, and would you do that for Indian languages? I recalled and advised my friends about an incident that happened a few years ago when we did some public forum, one on asthma and another one 
on um, smoking. And we could, while we could attract 2,000 people for the session on asthma, we could barely muster 100 people for the smoking uh, session. So I said, this is a very difficult message and very difficult subject to give a message to the audience who may or may not be interested in listening to it. So I said, you can't take the same materials that are culturally inappropriate or uh, different for this kind of audience. So they challenged me, and they gave me a challenge grant and asked me to develop uh, materials. And I was very fortunate to develop uh, these materials in various uh, languages, in about seven languages for different uh, ages and um, cartoons and books and, and so on. And the reach of these products has been uh, more than 150,000 kids uh, that I know of in India and uh, 60,000 kids right here in Texas. So that's how you can probably contribute by leveraging large numbers. Again, I must say that when I came to this country, some of my physical attributes, which uh, I had not paid too much attention, became obvious. Suddenly, I was a woman of color, a foreign medical graduate, and of course, a vertically challenged woman. <laughs> and uh, because of that, but none of that mattered, because I found that this strange new land, which seems to welcome a total stranger, caught let them call it home, raise a family, and reach a pinnacle of their career. Um, and this, for this opportunity, I'm really grateful. I just want to uh, conclude that when I was in, um, uh, one time in Athens, I took a stroll on a very uh, lonely road, a very sparsely populated road. Then suddenly I was reflecting in the twilight sun. I said, God, where was I born? Where did I end up? What am I doing here? Did my grandmother ever think that she would get through her life with four children to feed and educate? Did my mother ever think in her life when she was waiting on a train just to watch a train go by for three hours in amazement, ever think she would go to college? And did I ever think in my medicals, even in medical school, that I would end up in USA and roam the world? What magic pill did I take to end up here? If I clicked my heels, would I be in my hometown in, in India? And I just want to conclude with one concluding remark, since I see a lot of uh, women in the audience. It is well said that behind every successful man is a devoted woman. I'd be reminisce if I'd say, if I don't agree with this statement, I have to say I agree with this statement, which says that behind every successful woman is a hungry man waiting for dinner. Thank you.